Jason DeSantis, the people, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Frederick Mellon, behalf of Mr. Merowitz, who's seated to my left. Thank you. Ma'am, your name for the record, please. Megan Merowitz. And Mr. Merowitz, today's a date and time for your sentencing. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Mr. Sands, have you had an opportunity to review the PSI? I have, Judge. Um, I do have uh, corrections I'd like to make, and I included in my sentencing memorandum um, as pertains to the OVs. I believe that OV10 should be scored at five points, um, and that OV5 should be scored at 15 points. Um, I did state the reason for that in the memorandum. It would not change the overall guidelines, um, but I believe those are correct. Okay. Mr. Miller? Your Honor, I've discussed it, and I believe that that is correct. Okay. And Both for are correct. Okay, so with regard to um, the OV, there's a stipulation. Correct. Okay, court will accept the stipulation. And again, the overall OB guidelines would five, not change. OV um, five at 15 points. Thank you, Judge. And OV uh, 10 at five points. Is there a stipulation with regard to the second OV? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, court will take the stipulation. So the total know. OVs now um, are at 75 points. The guidelines do not change. Anything um, further with regard to any additions, deletions, corrections? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Anything addition with regard to additions, deletions, corrections? Uh, no, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Miller? I did. Uh, no, Your Honor, although I, I do have a letter from her younger sister and younger brother. Technically, they're victims. Uh, they would prefer you to read these. If I can approach, I'll hand them to you. I have seen it. Okay. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. DeSantis, any allocution? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the first thing I'd like, like to say is uh, I have been in conversation, of course, with Austin Amirowitz, um, Mr. Conrad Amirowitz's next of kin and son, um, as well as Thomas Amirowitz, his brother. Uh, they did submit a letter as a family, which I also attached my sentencing memorandum for your review. Um, they were not going to be present today because it was extremely difficult for Mr. Ramirez to sit through the trial, um, and they're going to take the opportunity for them to uh, watch remotely on the feed afterwards. Um, but they wanted you to know that they were they were here, they were watching. Of course, they did um, submit the letter, so okay. that's going to suffice for their statement, Judge. Thank you. Um, and are you going to be reading that into the record? It's attached to the sentencing memorandum, which we did e-file, Judge, so it's already in the record. So I, I didn't need to, if you, unless Your Honor has not read it. I assumed you have. I have read it. I figured. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't going to read it today, Judge. Um, as to anything else, Judge, I don't have a ton to add, um, if I may. The guidelines in this case are 51 to 85. That's four and a quarter years uh, to seven years on the low end. Um, I believe you should sentence her to the full seven years on the low end. Lots of people do make mistakes, or they do things without intending them or without fully understanding the harm. Um, in the vast majority of circumstances, when it does happen, the harm is minimal and can only be minimal. That's not the case here. Um, this is the only the only reason you're going to cover someone with a chemical substance that we use to clean metal, porcelain, ceramic is to hurt them. And that's not the case of someone like throwing a punch and the victim falls and hurts themselves. If she had done something like that or gotten on top of her father and struck him over and over and over and over and over, the harm still would have been less in this case. She chose to do this particular method. Um, so I think that's something that should be taken into account in your decision. The other thing I would say is that, of course, um, when she committed this crime, she didn't just deny, you know, didn't take his life alone. She also denied the family, a father, a son, and a brother, and also she took herself away from her family, too. Um, her actions took away Thomas's niece, Austin's sister, um, Morgan and Ian's sister. Um, you're supposed to have your siblings around you when a parent passes, and in this instance, that couldn't happen um, because of her, her choices and her responsibility. So I think those are things you should consider. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Judge, you did hear the trial. Uh, you did not hear from Megan. I would indicate that Megan is just past 18 when this occurred. And she may be an adult, but she's still a child. Um, very much so. This is a horrible situation. She's aware of it. But she's extremely young. I don't believe she's an adult at all. She needs help, and I'm just requesting that you go to the bottom of the guidelines. Mr. Mayor, was anything you'd like to say? Can I get one hand? Um, is it possible to release one hand so she could turn the page? Yep, is that okay? Yes. Proceed from the table, or you can go to the podium. Do you want to stand up and do it? 
You can. Okay. Sometimes in life, we are faced with troubles. Those we don't wish for, and most are never imaginable. Sorry. Yet we face them anyways. 19 years ago, I was placed into the arms of the first man to ever love me. The man I'm lucky enough to call my dad. Growing up, he became so much more. He was a storyteller, a tooth fairy, a friend and hero. But through it all, the one thing that never changed was that he was mine. One of the biggest things overlooked in this case is that me and my siblings lost our dad too. That loss has severely broken us. My little brother was diagnosed with severe depression and at his age that will probably take over most of his life. He wasn't allowed to say goodbye to my dad. He's 15 and not only has to live with that scar, but at the same time has to watch his big sister fight to come home. My little sister is still traumatized from having her car surrounded and her sister taken away. And worst of all, until the police blurted out our dad was gone, we had no idea. She too was kept from saying goodbye and is also struggling as she watches me go through this. My mom lost him too. Nobody sees that, but that's true. They were in love once. She mothered his kids and she lost him. And then there's me. It's almost been two years and I haven't been able to mourn. I refuse to think he's gone because no part of me can handle losing him. Those first few days when I moved back in with my mom, I couldn't sleep. Some nights she'd wake up and find me crying on the bathroom floor. And every night I slept with a picture of him and I, losing him has taken every belief of love, hope, and happiness and destroyed it. I am the best parts of him. I'm his daughter. But without him, I don't know who I am anymore. He was my reason. And now every day I battle with self harm. When I was younger, I'd count the days until I could live with him, with my dad full time. And when that day finally came, for the first time in my life, I could finally exhale. He was my best friend, and the person I talked to about boys, the one who knew every single thing about me, and my favorite person to laugh with. My dad has always been the one constant in my life. That alone, and that created an unbreakable bond between us, and no one, not especially Mr. DeSantis, can take that away from me. I never got to say goodbye, and that's a scar I'll never be able to lose. I get so scared that he thinks I didn't love him because I wasn't allowed to be there and hold his hand. If all the fears in life, that shouldn't be one of them. Nobody even wants to talk about him. Like we're just supposed to move on, but I can't. That's my dad if he's gone and no matter how much I beg God, he's not coming back. He told me so many things in life. But the one thing he, he never taught me was how to live without him. I don't want to learn. I just want my dad. Austin let him give up. And it's not fair that Austin abused my dad both mentally and physically and still got to be the one at his side. Look what it did. He gave up. He would have fought for me and he'd never leave me. Every single day, I'll pretend I'm in a coma for one of my suicide attempts and that one day soon, God will wake me up and my dad will be there waiting for me. But there's no waking up, is there? It's wrong that that's the one thing that gets me by. A belief that's not even real. A hope that's supposed to defy reality. But that's all it is, though. And one of the worst ways to cope. And now it's mine. On October 1st, I woke up only to find my dad drunk. Yeah, it was disappointing, but I understood why he was. Those last weeks, few weeks were hard on us because Austin was moving out and we weren't ready for that. Those last few weeks I self-harmed so who was I to be mad at my dad for his way of coping? Yeah, I whined and complained but it was no different from any other time. 
He kept falling asleep in the middle of my and me complaining. And when I yelled, Dad, he wouldn't wake up. So I tossed some bread at him because he pees in bags and puts them on the floor and it leaked that day so I couldn't get to him to tap his leg. When he didn't wake up, I tossed some lightweight things at the end of the couch so it would vibrate and wake him. I never threw water, but I knew why the couch was wet, so it was easier to lie than to admit your dad made him so. He did wake up, though, and we talked it out. And although Mr. DeSantis would like to theorize on his consciousness, my dad and I both have said that we talked it out, and we don't leave angry. I would never, and I would never hurt my dad. I am not my brother. And I'd like to point that out, that my party wasn't a big deal. I'd already celebrated, and if the hotel didn't work out, me and my friends would still would have still hung out. The only thing that excited me about turning 18 was that I was finally old enough to hold the puppies at the 12 Oaks Mall. And you want to know how I spent my birthday? My dad woke me up with cake and my favorite foods. You know why? Because he's a good dad. Yeah, he had his problems, but he was human. And just like humans, he felt pain and coped with it. He was good to get better one day. I believed in him. And now I don't even get to see that day. <laughs> One major thing I'd like to point out is that my, to my dad told the police and my brother, my bro and my brother, I didn't do it. And only that did that change after being alone with Austin, who admitted he told my dad that's not ha what happened. But how would he know? So when Austin didn't like the truth, he changed it. But he can't change my truth. Not this time. <laughs> The evil are ensnared by the transgressions of their lips, with the righteous escape from trouble. Proverbs 12:13. Although my attorney didn't provide an alternate theory while defending me, it's clear that in the discovery where there were other people who weren't being truthful and should have been questioned as well. And you'd think because one of my brother's hobbies is hurting my dad, he would have been questioned. But all it took was for my brother who at this point changed the truth to point the finger at me. In the police video, if you pay close attention, you will find that I only agreed to the things they said first. Just like my brother, I'd do anything to protect my dad and the possibility of self-harm, even lie. And I apologize for those lies. If I knew that a simple lie would ruin my life, I would have closed my mouth. We all learn at some point. I wish more than anything I would have testified at trial, but I can't go back, and I can only fight my butt off right now. This whole time, the prosecution has tried to make me look like a monster, but that's not me, and it never was. The real me is a girl who laughs a little too loudly and loves a little too hard, and the kind of girl who sees the best in everyone. I babysit kids for moms that can't afford much and volunteer at vacation Bible school. I was on the soccer team and performed in the choir and musicals. And my favorite thing is when my dad would wake me up in the crack of dawn to show me the deer in our yard. I'm a good student and sister, but most importantly, I'm a good daughter. I was the only one who took care of my dad, even though it was hard, it made me feel loved and needed. My dad was proud of the girl I was becoming, and even now I know he's looking down from heaven, proud that I've been strong enough to get here. He's strong enough to still fight. I didn't just lose my dad, but I lost my big brother. And this whole time I've tried to hate him for what he did, but I can only forgive him, and I hope he knows that I'll always love him, no matter what. One of my biggest fears moving forward is that when people will think that I'm some monster, something I'm far from. Mr. So Mr. DeSantis so badly wants to take away my future without a care thing for the past 17 months. I've sat and faced some of the hardest punishments. My great uncle died, and again I didn't get to say goodbye. My brother needs me, and I can't be there to help him. Greatest of all, I have to live in a world where my dad is not it. I have to live with the fact that I didn't even get to say goodbye or I love you. That alone is a lifelong punishment. And no matter how Mr. DeSantis tries, he can't make me something I'm not. My one question is what gives anyone the right to judge without knowing what's in the heart? As I stand here, I'm being judged without being known. 
The prosecution's job is to make me look bad, make himself doesn't know me. What part of me makes me a monster? Is it the kids who teaches kids? Is it the girl who teaches kids about God? Is it the girl who every year for her brother's birthday threw him a surprise birthday party just to sh just, just so he'd remember I loved him? Or is it the girl who quit her job to take care of her dad? We as humans spend our whole lives judging others without knowing anything about them except what others say. But when will it stop? What gives us, what gives us the right? You know how many people stand up and get persecuted only to be found guilty yet years and years later are actually found innocent? Those mistakes ruin lives. I want to be the change. Since I've been in jail, I've taken the time to mature and find my strength. I've learned a lot. I've met people with stories like mine and others who are given second chances. I spent the past 17 months in the crazy people pod because my close friend can't move for security reasons and I refuse to leave her side. She's been my rock and the only person who keeps my dad's memory alive for me. One of my most memorable accomplishments is that I read the whole Bible front to back. It's crazy what someone can accomplish when you put your mind to it. I have so many goals in life, and I need your help to make them happen. I'm 19 years old. That's not a lot, and I don't get in trouble. I have my whole future ahead of me. I want to go to Hope College with my sister to, agree to get a degree in psychology and then transfer to SPSU for marine biology. One day, I want to open a marine rescue and rehabilitation center. We're alone with helping you rehabilitate marine life. I will set up programs to help kids with depression or troubled kids who need a good outlet, find a purpose through giving animals their purpose back. I know it sounds silly, but it's my dream. I want to change the world. My future isn't just about me, though. It's about my family. It's about the little boy at home who needs his sister. I want to watch him grow up and have his first girlfriend and to make Eagle Scout. It's about my sister who I've already missed milestones of hers, of ours. And more than anything, I want to be by her side again. I want to be there to remind them about her dad and who he was. It's about my grandparents who aren't getting any younger, who constantly have health problems. I want to spend time with them while I can for them to see me marry my boyfriend. I don't want to lose any more goodbyes. And last but not least, it's about my mom, who's become the reason I'm still strong. I lost my dad and now I've been giving an everlasting fear that I'll lose her too. It's just, it's not just about my life on the line, but theirs too. Please don't take me away from them. They're all I have left. More than anything, it's about my dad, who believed in his daughter, who's looking down from heaven right now, giving me the words to say, I'll forever live every day for him, and one day when I change the world, I'll look up to the stars, and finally say we did it. Your Honor, a while back, I had the chance to watch you give a boy named Armani Jackson a chance. And it stuck with me because he was around my age. And like me, he had dreams of college and a future. You cared enough to ask him about more, about, oh, about, but more importantly, you cared enough to give him the chance to go make those dreams true, make those dreams too. I've watched as you've given so many people chances and some who may not have deserved them. And once, once upon a time, you dreamed of being a judge. And part of me believes it's because some people deserve another chance. You've accomplished your dream, and I guess now I'm asking for you to help me accomplish mine. In a world full of wrongful judgment, I'm asking you to be the change. To believe in me the way my dad did. I'm going to ask for the lower end of my guidelines, but even lower, if possible. I'm not a threat to society, but an asset for the future. When I get home, I'll finish high school and start college. I'll get a job and go to therapy. I'll change the world. 
it's just not it's not just me you'd be giving a chance but all those people who wrote you and all those people out there who support me and this isn't just me anymore please be my miracle if you try my heart if you visit me by night if you test me you will find the wickedness in me my mouth does not transgress as for what others do by the word of your lips i have avoided the ways of the violent my steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. Psalm 17, 3 through 5. I pray my words mean something. I pray that you bring me up. Thank you. Um, is there anybody in the courtroom who wanted to make a statement? Um, I see Ms. Merowitz here. Or, I'm sorry, Ms. Conrad here. Um, Ma'am, you provided a statement that you'd like me to read. Is that correct? Judge, at this point, I would object. I don't think she has any, any particular rights under the Crime Victims' Rights Act to address the court. It is your courtroom, of course. Okay. Um, the court does give me, the court rules do give me discretion to allow additional um, statements. Um, so the court is going to allow it. Ma'am, would you like to speak on your own, or would you like me to read your statement? Come and speak. Okay. Absolutely. Can you come to the microphone? For the record, please. Julie Conrad. Go ahead, please. Your Honor, as with every trial, not everything is brought up in front of the jury. And there's so many complexities to this case. And so much that was not included that you know I feel was left out. We don't know what happened that day. There's no fingerprints from the bottle. When I returned with Megan on the Wednesday after this happened for her retriever stuff, when we were escorted by a state trooper, the bottle was sitting on the couch. It was still there. Anyone could have touched it. Why were, why was a th more thorough investigation not done? These are my questions of how, you know, the two plus two with all the facts that are known, the actual facts, not the hearsay or the testimony, but the physical facts two plus two has just not equaled four. My children and I, and by the my children, I do mean all four of them, we have all suffered. I have lost a son, but he had already planned to leave the family. He had already discussed this with me that summer that he just wanted to leave and never have contact with the family again. So I knew at some point he could do that. But with also losing Megan, not being able to actually look her straight in the eye or to hug her for the last 17 months, a mother's nightmare. <laughs> the way we found out about Conrad's death is when Megan and Morgan were pulled over. No one notified us that he was um, in hospice care and at home. 
the uh, minor children, Austin or Morgan and Ian were both minors at the time, and they were prevented by their brother from having any contact whatsoever with their father. They were not allowed to go to the hospital. They were not allowed to have any phone contact. They're, and they have anything sent to Conrad would have been shredded. Morgan tried multiple times to reach out to her father and was prevented. Ian, unfortunately, has never really had a chance to get his, to know his dad, but knows his dad through the stories that we tell him, the stories that I tell him, that Morgan tells him, that Megan tells him. We were a broken family before this began, and now we're even more broken. wish for you to be lenient on Megan while her age, you know, her body is 19 years old. Her maturity level, her emotional level is not that of an adult. She was never prepared for adulthood. She she could not even make a doctor's appointment for herself right now. But she does not have the knowledge. She was not taught that. But thank you for reading all the letters that you've received, both on both sides. Thank you for taking your time with all of this. Thank you, Your Honor. Is there anybody else in the courtroom who wanted to make a statement? And with regard to the letters that I have, I have a letter from Julie Conrad, a letter from Morgan, and a letter from Ian, correct? Those are the ones I've seen, Judge. Those are the ones that you want me to read. There was a letter from the clergy right. member at the, um, at the jail. That's not being requested to be read into the record? Not to be read into the record, no, Your Honor. Okay. But you can read it. Okay, Your Honor, can I say one thing before you go? Absolutely. I, I want to address some of the statements that have been made about Austin today. Uh, and I just, because there's been some factual allegations and such, I think it should be noted for the court, or, or reminded for everyone, that Austin was 19 years old when this happened. He was suddenly thrust into the role of next of kin, caregiver, you know, manager of the estate and was suddenly without his father, without his mother, because his mother was helping the person that he believed had killed his father, and was trying to manage all this all at the same time while 19 years old. And so I think if we're gonna be talking and casting aspersions about that today, I think that should also be something that's taken into note. And you have a statement that he wanted me to read as well? The, the letter from Thomas is also from Austin, is my understanding, that's a joint family statement. Okay. Um, with regard to the letter, I have a letter, Dear Judge Valentine, I am Julie Conrad, mother of Austin, Megan, Morgan, and Ian, and former wife of Conrad Amerowitz. I first apologize for making a joke and laughing during my testimony. People have different ways of dealing with stress, and my way of joking to relieve stress and anxiety is not always done in a proper time or location. Conrad and I adopted Austin when he was 27 days old. 14 months later, we adopted Megan. When she was three days old, she had a tough start to life and went through four months of withdrawal from whatever her birth mother was on. Our, to our surprise, I found out I was pregnant with Morgan. While the girls are supposed to be just over a year apart in age due to complications, the girls are 11 months apart in age. Three years later, another surprise in the form of Ian arrived. Megan has had issues with abandonment and with her birth mother, gave her up and had been in therapy to help her. As with all children, there are disagreements. When these disagreements occurred, I would immediately separate the children, go to speak individually and privately with each one so that I could put together what happened and if anyone needed time out. Without being at Conrad's home on Friday, October 1st, 2021, I have no idea what happened. After listening to what people did know or say they knew, 
2 plus 2 was not anywhere close to equaling 4. I am an assistant scoutmaster in Ian's troop. I have take I take the South Scout oath and law very seriously, and my best to live as I as a scout should. I have only wanted the truth to come out. Given the sad state of our family dynamics, I know the truth will never be revealed. There will always be doubt and question in my mind as to what happened. Megan, to me, is a typical teenager. She is concerned about boys, makeup, hair, and clothing. When Megan does not get her way, I have witnessed so many times how she'll argue, scream, and pour on the tears, stomp to her bedroom, and slam the door. Drama. To me, drama belongs on a TV or a stage. I am a numbers person, and the numbers are factual. I have heard Conrad sorry. state... I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, at this point, I do want to object to the remainder of the letter being read because these are simply unsubstantiated allegations of facts about other instances in this case and other people and witnesses, and I don't think it's appropriate for them to be read in the record, especially by someone who doesn't have a right to address the court and is now getting to do so twice. Okay, so Mr. DeSantis, my understanding was that you were provided that these letters before the sentencing and that there was not an objection and you requested that I read them into the record. I did not request that they be read in the record. I said I was provided with the letters and I'm, and I'm fine with some of it being read, but some of it is not. But you didn't make that objection before I started. So what are you requesting that I not read into the record? From that point on, Judge. The rest of it's simply about other, you know, other instances that were not, you know, pertains to the case. Um, and it's just it's just factual aspersions about witnesses and other people. Okay. And I'll also note that Ms. Conrad also addressed the court, which I didn't know she was going to get to do as well. Okay. Um, I have no objections to anything contained in Morgan's letter or Ian's letter. Okay. So you just don't want the rest of Ms. Uh, Conrad's letter read into the record. Anything you'd like to state, sir? Your Honor, it is your, your decision. Okay. Um, with regard to the sentencing, I'm not sure that any past issues will assist the court with regard to sentencing so i will not read anything further into the record um, but i will read morgan's statement as well as um, ian's statement any anything that you're requesting to not be stated with regard to these letters? no judge those two are absolutely victims in the case in next again they have a right to address the court and there's nothing in particular that is objectionable thank you dear judge valentine my name is morgan I am the third child of Conrad Amerowitz. My parents gave me the name quite close to my older sister's, Megan. Not to mention we are 11 months apart in age. Because of this, we are always labeled as the girls growing up, barely ever not being grouped together. We shared a room for a good portion of our childhood at both houses and went back and forth between sharing and not sharing a room at our dad's house. We did the same sport growing up. We went to the same camps. We were in the same grade once in a while being in the same classes, and occasionally we would have the same friends. I could always count on her if I couldn't find any new friends to play with in the park or make me mac and cheese when I was hungry. She was there to protect me every step of the way. I always knew that she was going to be there whether I wanted her or not. She was my best friend and my other half. Well, Megan was my best friend, but I was not hers. My position belongs to my dad. That position belonged to my dad. He was her other half. I have never seen someone love another as much as Megan loved my dad. She was always his little girl. They stuck together. She supported him through everything and always wanted the best for him. She continued to try to help him even when he refused. It's hard to get someone help when they do not want it, but, she, but still she tried. During late 2021 and early 22, Megan stayed with us. She never talked ill of our father in her bedroom. She has pictures hung up of two of them and had her screensaver on her phone set to a picture of him and her as a baby. Megan loved my dad with all her heart and knowing that was her, knowing that he was hurt broke her. She constantly prayed that he would be okay. My sister has said to me, what is life without dad? because what is life without your best friend? She has been serving time for over a year now, away from everyone that considers her their best friend, without people that love her most while she is without the person that she loves the most. She has lived a life that has been fulfilled with heartbreak 
after heartbreak and is never ending. While others have hated, have hatred for the sick, she only had love. Others like to compare their story to hers. It is not the same, nor will it ever be. Everyone has a different past and no one should be comparing ones to others. Thank you, Megan, Morgan and Merowitz. Dear Judge Valentine, my name is Ian James Amerowitz. I would not like this letter, it says he would not like this letter to be read in open court. I, I'm content with the court just reading it silently. Thank you. I read it. I am as well. Um, with regard to um, Austin's letter and the uncle's letter, did you want to read that into the record, Mr. I, I think at this point I should judge as other rec letters right. have been read. <clears throat> Honorable Judge Valentine, my big brother Conrad Amirowitz taught me to, how to ski, throw a football, drive, and grow up, knowing that he is someone I can go to when I needed help and guidance. He listened to my problems, never judged me, and always asked me how he can help. I miss him dearly. The words cannot explain how much of a void and darkness is surrounding my family, knowing that we lost him. His loving, and easy, with easy going de his loving nature with easygoing demeanor continued with his kids and everyone who encountered him. He was a scout leader and continued to offer help and mentorships to every kid that needed it. Even during tough times, he never lost his generosity. Throughout her life, Megan Amirowitz had numerous behavioral issues and got into multiple troubles. My brother was always there and never gave up. When Megan and her mother, Julie Conrad, had his issues, he was there to welcome her with open arms. He even fought for her custody to remedy issues. When Megan stole his car and crashed it, my brother was there to support her. He did not tell us exactly what happened. It was unusual for him not to visit my parents, and we had no idea that he did not have a car because he protected Megan from any negative comment and encounter. After some time, we got to learn about it from others. He would take my parents' car to continue driving her around. When Megan pulled a knife in school and threatened a teacher, he was there to pick her up and enroll her in homeschool. He always had an open arm for her, always wanted her to be happy, and continuously tried to work around her behavioral issues. As always, with his calm nature, he never lost his temper and unconditionally loved her. Then on the morning of October 1, 2021, Megan poured lye powder on her dad, Conrad Amirowitz, and left him to die because he could not drive her to the appointment. Megan left my brother with horrendous suffering, dreadful pain, and in horrific condition. There is no way I can describe how my father and my family felt when they saw the pictures. Until now, I have not let my wife and mother see those pictures. Every time I am reminded of a great memory with my brother, I also remember the dreadful pictures. I cannot think or remember my brother without horrible recollection of how he died. All that got worse when we found out Megan had proceeded to go to a hotel for her birthday party and had the audacity to ask for Conrad's credit card info to pay for her party. At times, I think this senseless act was the only reason that Conrad was found alive and taken to the hospital. I am grateful that he got treatments and strong drugs at the end so that he did not die in total suffering without help. Conrad spent six months in the burn unit. Every day he had complications. Every day we had hope. My family prayed every day for him to be with us. My nephew Austin was there constantly to see his father, even when we heard that they had to amputate his feet and part of his leg. We started thinking about his care after the hospital. We talked multiple times every day to plan for his care. We prayed every day, but he could not recover from his injuries and left us. He died at home as was his wish with my nephew Austin by his side. Austin has had to do through the horror Austin has had to do through the horror of seeing his father suffering from his injuries and dying in front of him, all with the knowledge that his sister Megan did this to their father. The suffering to my parents, myself, my nephew, and family is unspeakable. My parents not only lost a child, but they also need to deal with the trauma of knowing that their grandchild took the life of their son in a way unimaginable with no remorse, knowing that she never took responsibility for her act and always blamed others for her horrific act. Megan took away a father, a son, a brother, and an uncle without remorse and in a cruel way. She gave us all a life sentence of dealing with our lost. Megan <clears throat> deserves a life sentence. Respectfully yours, Thomas Amirowitz, brother of Conrad Amirowitz, on behalf of the Amirowitz family. Thank, Thank you. you. Anything further? Nothing for the people. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Okay. okay. Um, Ms. Amirowitz, case number 2022-281-519-FC. Harmful devices, irritants, unlawful possession, or use causing death. I mean, with regard to this matter, the court has reviewed the PSI. It has reviewed your compass score and your prior criminal history. 
The circumstances that you have endured during your adolescent life um, are somewhat detailed in the PSR. The report indicates physical abuse and attempted sexual assault by a friend of a sibling, which was not addressed by your parents. Your adoptive parents uh, separated when you were eight and a half years old. You endured both physical abuse and while you indicate that you were raised by both of your parents, the court does recognize that your father was a severe alcoholic. His disease could not make him a fit parent and he always put you in harm's way. Your childhoods was lined with abuse, the inability to grow mentally as a child. Your only criminal history was driving offense that your father was unable to drive you. The PSI indicates that he would pick you up while intoxicated and that you had to quit your job to care for your father. Your father described you as an angel, making it clear that you do not have malice. It is clear that your father's addiction and the denial of his addiction alienated his family. Your parents divorced when you were approximately eight and a half years old. Your younger siblings could not endure visiting your father anymore. Your father, your younger sister testified that the last time that she was at the house, she shared a bathroom with your father and that there was vomit in the shower, in the sink, and toilet paper all over the bathroom. The first responders could not attend to your father because of the filth inside the house, that it was not fit for habitation. Garbage bagged and unbagged garbage filled the home. The home was infested with visible fleas and bugs, and the PSI describes plastic bags filled with urine near the couch. Your mother testi about, testified about human feces around the couch as well. There were several animals in the home and food containers and debris throughout the house. Your father indicated that he set off a bug bomb the day before the incident but failed to vacate the home. Your father's disease clearly created a cloud of deception and denial according to Conrad's statement to the police that he consumed a half a bottle of Smirnoff ice and that he was napsing, not intoxicated. This is inconsistent with the medical information of a blood alcohol level of approximately 0.3. Your mother, your younger siblings, and your other older brother all left the home, leaving you with the daunting task of caring for your father. The denial of the disease from your father and your brother's belief that your father was not an alcoholic weighed on your shoulders. The mental health that you suffered started to climb when you were 10 years old. You struggled with suicidal idealizations. You have been diagnosed with severe depression, anxiety. You were hospitalized multiple times, most recently around your 16th birthday for a week in Harbor Oaks Hospital. You completed 11th grade and you begun your senior year of high school at Brandon High School. Your senior year should be filled with excitement of being a child, celebrating your accomplishments and completing high school and planning your future. You did not have the luxury of being a child as you indicated that you had to be an adult in the house. This is a serious crime that you have been found guilty of. The court does not believe that a child your age knew or understood the consequences of throwing the items at your father or the damage that it would cause him. At the time of the incident, you were barely 18 years old. You were three days past your birthday. It is clear that your brain is not developed. The United States Supreme Court in Roper v. Simmon, a 2005 case, recognized that juveniles have less culpability and are less deserving of the harshest punishments due to the inherent immaturity and vulnerability. Graham versus Florida, a 2010 United States Supreme Court case, recognizes the difference between juvenile adults in terms of the capacity for rehabilitation and change. Miller versus Alabama, the 2012 United States Supreme Court case, recognized the unique characteristics of juveniles and their brain development and decision-making processes, and how these factors should be taken into account when determining the culpability and appropriate punishment. There is a recognition of the cognitive and emotional immaturity in juveniles that are inherently less mature than adults in their cognitive and emotional development. The decision-making process may be more impulsive and they be more, may be more susceptible to external influences, as the court noted. Juveniles have limited control over impulses as a prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain responsible for impulse control and decision-making continue to develop as adolescents. As a result, juveniles may have limited control over their impulses or actions as compared to adults. The capacity for change and rehabilitation, the courts want to highlight that juveniles possess a greater capacity for change and for rehabilitation compared to adults. 
And while adults' crime criminal behavior might be more fixed, juveniles are more likely and amenable to rehabilitation and positive change over time. The court held that the judges must have the discretion to consider the individual circumstances and the characteristics of the crime. The decision recognizes the significance of the brain development and its impact on the moral and legal culpability, paving the way for a more individualized and rehabilitative sentence for younger individuals involved in serious criminal offenses. This court is satisfied that you are unlikely to engage in offense or criminal course of conduct again, and that the public good does not require that the defendant suffer the penalty imposed by law. The court finds that the sentence must be proportionate to the seriousness of the crime surrounded the offense and the offender. The court recognizes that you have indicated that you have professional goals of becoming a marine biologist and that you plan to open a rescue for marine life after completion of high school and college and that you would like to start a charity to help recovering alcoholics. With regard to this matter, the court is going to sentence you to one year in jail with 506 days credit. The guidelines are 51 to 75 to 85, correct? 51 to 85. 51 to 85 now. Um, with regard to your sentencing, you are sentenced to five years of probation. I want you to understand that with regard to this opportunity, that if you are not successful with regard to probation, the prison term of five to 25 years is on the table. The state costs are $68, the crime victim right fund is $130. Supervision fees are $30 a month or $60 a month while on electronic monitoring system. You are to participate in the outpatient behavior, cognitive behavior program. You're not to use, purchase, or possess any alcoholic beverages or enter into any establishments that dispense them. You're to submit to alcohol and drug testing as directed by your probation officer. You're not to use any controlled substances without a prescription. You're to participate in outpatient or residential substance abuse treatment as directed by your probation officer. You're to you are to participate in mental health treatment. You are to complete high school or an adult GED program. You're not to have any assault or threatening behavior, and you're not to possess or use any firearm or other deadly weapon. The court is going to put you on an intensive probation program with regard to the probation. There to be no violations with regard to this matter. The court recognizes that you have already served 506 days um, in the jail, but I do not take the charge lightly, and I want to ensure that what you're doing with your time that you're using to help better things for yourself and for other people. Do you understand? Mr. Sanis? Your Honor, I do, of course, have to object. I do not believe that that sentence is proportional. Uh, which is the measure here or reasonable. Um, it believes from your statements that you consider things like your employment or desire to have employment, uh, lack of criminal history and minimum culpability based on uh, some of the factors in Millery, Alabama, which I understand, but in People v. Daniel, 207, Mishap 47, 1994, those three things, employment, lack of criminal responsibility, and minimum culpability, are not unusual uh, circumstances that overcome the presumption of a proportional sentence within the guidelines. And with regard to the proportional sentence, thank you, I do note your um, objection with regard to the proportional sentence. The court is satisfied that this child has not um, had the upbringing that she does have the capacity with regard to um, change and with regard to being able to reform um, and that her, her mind is able to do good things. And I have indicated for the record that with regard to um, the sentencing that I have considered whether or not she has a criminal culpability um, or crimes that would continue to be committed. I have reviewed the pre-sentence investigation report. I have um, looked at everything in this case. I sat through the trial and I am satisfied based upon the information that I cited um, that she is not a threat to society, although I am going to have the intensive probation but I'm going to allow her to get on track and get back some of the years that she has lost 
um, as with her history. So the court is satisfied with regard to the proportionality. May I request a, a GPS tether in home confinement for the per duration of probation? For how long? I would say for the duration of probation. For five years? Yes, Judge. Someone died horribly. And I, I also want to note, Your Honor, that there in, <clears throat> excuse me one second. In People v. Anderson, 298 Mishap, 178 in 2012, um, a defendant's parents were severely burned. The, the trial judge there deviated upwards, finding that 25 points didn't adequately take into account the prolonged pain and suffering of the victims. And they found that as a reason to depart upwards. And I think in this case, we have exactly the same circumstance. So I, I want to put on the record. And what was the burn in that case? I was an arson judge, so I believe it was a fire burn. So it was an intentional setting something on fire. Yes. I'm satisfied with regard to the proportionality, as I stated, with regard to this matter. Um, this is a child um, who I think has the ability to be, um, to have a good life and to be a contributing member of society. Um, I do note your objection with regard to the tether. Um, Mr. Miller, I'll hear you with regard to the tether. Your Honor, with regard to a tether, I've got no problem if you want to keep track of her. I object to the home confinement. You wanted to get schooling. You wanted to get counseling. You wanted to have a job and move forward. I believe those are all important things. Um, home confinement is not going to let her do anything with regard to those. I would, if you want the tether to keep track of her, that's fine. She's been incarcerated for 17 months at this point. I would request, I don't see the need for the tether. If she violates, when she violates, she's going to be in major trouble. But at this point, I don't see a need for tether, and I strongly object to the home confinement. She needs to go out and get things going. She needs to get back in society. She needs to get counseling. She needs a variety of things, and the home confinement will not help. Home confinement doesn't restrict someone from getting medical treatment. If she is going to be out of course, we want her in therapy. Um, but Yes. Um, I do want her in therapy. I also want her completing her education. Um, I will give a tether. We'll do a review in six months with regard to the tether. Um, the home confinement, I will give you a curfew. You're not to be out past um, 9 o'clock. So you'll have a curfew. Um, and I want, I want you to be immediately enrolled in school in whatever form, either um, in school or online or your GED, whatever is the most appropriate. You can work with your probation officer on that but you are to continue your education. I want you in therapy. I want your mental health treated. Um, Judge, can we also ask that she participate in a psychological exam and follow any um, requirements that they suggest and that she sign a confidentiality waiver and that she take any medications that are prescribed to her by any psychologist or me mental health treatment facility? Yes. Anything else? Nothing for the people, Judge. Can I have a review in six months, please? January 23rd, I'm sorry, what's the date? January 23rd. 21st? January 23rd. Okay. At 8.30. Judge, and by January 23rd, are there specific requirements that you are asking that she have completed, or do you just want to know how far her progress is? I want her in the mental health treatment. I want her in school, um, so she should have made significant progress in school. I don't want there to be delay in getting into the school. Um, she needs to be in the counseling. Um, the, the mental health assessment needs to be done, barring some issue with regard to the scheduling. Uh, with regard to any type of testing, I'll leave that to the probation officer with regard to drug and alcohol testing. Any, anything else? Anything else from MDOC? No, Judge. Thank you. Anything else? I have provided her appellate rights for her. Okay. Ma'am, this has been your sentencing. You have a right to appeal your sentencing. You have 42 days to file an advice of rights form with this court if you do wish to appeal. If you cannot afford a lawyer, the court will appoint one for you. 
I expect you to do good things, Mr. Merowitz. Okay. Carry on your father's name. Thank you, deputies. Thank you. Thank you. Matters concluded. Please rise.